We're very fortunate to have President Scott Cohen uh, lecturing today. He's really an extraordinary architect, intellect, uh, educator, uh, and a colleague and friend. Uh, before I speak a little bit more on a theoretical level about Scott, uh, some facts, uh, and this is quite impressive. Uh, there are a number of projects under construction or recently completed, and they include the Datong City Library, the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, the Amir Building, uh, the Taiwan Museum of Art in China, the Nanjing Performing Arts Center in China, the Goldman Sachs Canopy with uh, Paycott Freed Associates in New York, and the Goodman House in Pi Pine Plains, New York. Uh, like a number of of significant architects today, uh, Scott spent many years, um, I would say, uh, establishing a theoretical position and honing his craft uh, en route to building. And now he's getting the opportunity to put these ideas uh, into the ground, and it's an extraordinary feat, and it's very exciting to watch for all of us. Um, he's won a number of competition first prizes the Datong Public Library, uh, the Taiwan Museum of Art were first prizes in the competition, Robbins Elementary School in Trenton, New Jersey, and the Herta Paul Amir Building in Tel Aviv Museum of Art. He's won a series of Progressive Architecture Awards, um, Orda's office, office Complex, again the Museum, Museum of Art and Art in uh, Taiwan, in, in Taiwan. Uh, Tel Aviv Museum of Art was a Progressive Architecture Award. The Chorus House, which many of you have seen, uh, I think it's a seminal project uh, and certainly um, had a resounding impact, I think, on the discipline in terms of uh, utilizing the most sophisticated software available and moving it into a direction that was poignant and innovative and really quite uh, sensuous and radical at the same time. The Terminal House won a Progressive Architecture Award. Uh, in addition to that, he's won a Visionary Award from the Tel Aviv Museum, an Academy Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, Scott is the current chair and uh, uh, Gerald M. McHugh Professor of Architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design certainly one of the most important programs in architecture in the world today, uh, and I think it was a remarkable uh, appointment for Harvard and certainly uh, a great opportunity for Scott to move his vision uh, even further within the academic environment. Uh, prior to that appointment as the chair, uh, he taught at Princeton University, Rhode Island School of Design, Ohio State University, uh, he held the Frank Gehry International Chair at the University of Toronto uh, and the Perloff Professor at the University of California in LA. Uh, a significant publication, which you should all go out uh, tomorrow and purchase, uh, is called The Contested Symmetries uh, by Princeton Architectural Press, and that came out in 2001. And uh, just a few comments on that book. Uh, one of the things which I think um, among many that distinguishes Scott is that he is actively uh, and rigorously involved in a methodological process where the early stages of design development, which are both conceptually motivated and formally driven, uh, underlie all the design projects so that in this book, you basically understand how he thinks, where his sources of inspiration come from, uh, and there are many, and they come from the past, and he's been able to mine uh, history in a new and innovative way. And, and that I, I raise that or highlight that issue because there are many designers today that somehow uh, consider uh, their current production as being detached from a long legacy uh, of great architectural work uh, and that's not the case in Scott's career. Um, this uh, appears to uh, reoccur uh, online as a description of his practice, and I thought I would use this as a preface before I say a few more things. 
Uh, architect uh, Preston Scott Cohen combines the use of the most advanced digital modeling technology with a fascination for the 17th century descriptive geometry. He uses familiar forms distorted by oblique projections and similar devices to create complex designs that challenge our preconceptions about the nature of order in architecture. Um, and I thought I would uh, uh, list, if, although there's, I believe there's only six or seven, Scott, the, the top 10 distinctive attributes of a Preston Scott Cohen's practice. Uh, in no particular order, and I mentioned this a bit uh, previously, there's a deep understanding of the history of architecture uh, as well as an extensive legacy of syntactical expressions. Uh, someone who certainly uh, reads effects in terms of uh, what their cultural origins are uh, and how they may be uh, regulated from an operational standpoint. Number two, the work is methodologically uh, rigorous. I, I find that extremely refreshing and certainly uh, if one looks closely at the value of of bringing together academia and the practice, um, there really should be a far greater affiliation or affinity between the two. That is to say that the research that you guys are engaged in now and the way in which you pursue that research should continue after you graduate. Uh, there's a critical relation between drawings and models driven by analytical experiments. So Scott is always moving back and forth between these mediums as a way to test uh, something quite enigmatic and I would say spatially often very complex. Uh, he's a master of representation. Uh, uh, it highlights the art and speculative opportunities of drawing as an emergent process. Uh, the first time I encountered Scott, uh, I think it was in the 90s, I believe there was an exhibition or I'd seen your work someplace in person uh, at the GSD and the drawings were filled with a kind of wonderment, a kind of flight of speculative uh, um, uh, obsession. And I would say the novice or the, the less curious architect would look at this and, and try to generalize this as just a drawing uh, or just as an experiment. It seems to me that, that like a Paranese, he was using the drawings as a way to solidify or at least uh, identify in a more concrete way what his architectural and theoretical position was. And I think it's living proof now 20 years later that it has been concretized and it's moved over into buildings. Uh, Scott's fascinated with the anomaly in architecture. And I see, I, I use that term, although that has been used to describe your work. Uh, to me, it's a kind of, another way of saying it, it's the ineffable. It's something that uh, occurs that has a kind of uh, strangeness. Uh, it may even be unfamiliar, but it's certainly captivating and it has enormous amount of uh, opportunity. Uh, and it's often generated, uh, not through accident, but through laser sharp geometric uh, operations. Uh, and I would follow that by saying Scott's always, he seems to be in search of the unexpected or an almost paradoxical spatial formation. Now, number five, uh, if one is assessing the world through a taxonomic window, uh, Scott Cerf uh, is in pursuit of a strangely beautiful hybrid typologies uh, and ones that are not easily categorized, which uh, places him in a, in a rather, uh, I think, uh, fantastic place within the discipline, but maybe difficult for many historians and theoreticians to be able to fully understand the work uh, and, and provide some kind of frame to it. Uh, I would describe Scott in possession of a curious mind. Uh, if you'll ever see Scott, well, you'll see it tonight, but on juries, uh, uh, he's, uh, he's in like an electric uh, wire. I mean, he's always uh, thinking about the problem from a variety of perspectives, and certainly I imagine that's the way he teaches, that's the way he oversees the School of Architecture at Harvard. Uh, it's not about finding answers, it's about defining questions and establishing trajectories for himself and those uh, of his uh, followers and students and colleagues. 
And finally, I think the work is truly visionary. Uh, there's an unrelenting spirit favoring spatial invention as well as an architecture of provocation. Um, and I think uh, it's only apropos that at this point in his career, these wonderfully theoretical and, and, and speculative propositions are now uh, materializing in, in the form of great buildings around the world. And with that, Scott, welcome to the School of Architecture. Thank you, Evan, so much. Um, wow, I I only have four under one, um, <laughs> under one category, really. But uh, clearly, that was um, really a moving and pleasant thing. Um, so having me here is also I really am so I apologize for being late. I will try to keep it a little bit more brief. Um, but basically, this is a kind of outline of some of the ideas that have been operative. Um, oh, could we have all 10? It would be better for the image. But anyway. Oh, okay. I'm the painter. Okay, <laughs> fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> Anyhow. Um, <laughs> basically, um, oh, sorry, let's look back. <laughs> Looking at this, again, I'm, I'm going to talk about these themes. They all fall, as I said, under this term, this single topic of attenuation, which somehow gathers everything together. The projects move between all of them, and there's no way, there isn't any way to put them correctly into their places, but I will do my best to kind of narrate this, this series. So we'll start with this idea that I call the anamorphic threshold. You all know about anamorphosis, I think. I mean, it's such a thrilling idea because it involves everything we're you know, invested in, the kind of condition in which the image appears to us only when we occupy space in a very particular way. I mean, but for me, it goes further in that, and I think for everyone it does, it has to do with the superimposition of two ideas that are so profoundly important in architecture. One is the notion of frontality, the proper viewing of, of it, of anything from its front, and the other the oblique, the, the off into the margins. Um, and there is a kind of condition of temporality involved in it. You know, as you move between the oblique and the correct view, you're experiencing this transformation in time. So it's temporal, and it involves the actual characteristics of the object. And this led me into a whole series of investigations over a number of years of thinking about how this operates in architecture. If you were to take it to its logical conclusion, the threshold could be extended to become the entirety of the work of architecture. It had been for so long in the 20th century a kind of promenade, but in a house like this, it is the whole idea. We are simply looking at a house uh, through which we pass uh, to uh, arrive to a, a rootscape. And it happens again here, uh, not far away, just uh, within a half an hour of where we are now in fine times in New York, um, where again, we're passing through rather than into the house. And this idea of extending that experience of passage and in fact bypassing the entirety of architecture in that extension is, is one way, but there was another idea that was always looming, which was that the object itself is transformed. When we speak about attenuation, we're not only talking about something taking longer, literally extending our experience, but changing its form, stretching, as it were, literally, in space. This is a project downtown near the site of Ground Zero, uh, where an, a very awkward gap between two buildings bending in plan was taken as the site for this element of canopy, which is meant to kind of create this liminal space uh, caught between these two buildings and in tension with them because it kind of acts as a barometer of the angles of the context. It, it acts almost like a diagram of the forces that you could imagine producing the relationships that are there. 
but stretches it, stretches it out, you know, against, let's say, the more typical experience of successive days that give you a kind of measure of the space. This simply makes a single element, which changes our perception of the length and draws one to it and unexpectedly changes the, our understanding of its dimension. Um, and that is partly also uh, due to its material, uh, the reflectivity. We'll come back to the issue of the material at the end uh, when I speak more about tectonics and geometry. Um, now, that problem of the attenuage uh, here is moving into another set of conditions, and I would say more obviously, and that has to do with the second notion that I put forward, which I called the site as constraint. Probably no project was more developed according to this problem than the Tel Aviv Museum, a museum that needed to house rectangular galleries in what is almost a triangular site. The attenuation here, I would argue, has to do with the way in which the whole building extends the experience of entering this garden. This garden, which is uh, a space between the new building and the original, we arrive to by moving down this ramp. The whole building is, as it were, rotated very slightly uh, and thereby uh, transformed to uh, elaborate that entry. But the rotation is more momentous on the inside, where the idea is to create a space, a light well, that will bring light to the lowest reaches of a building which was required to be half below ground, too large for its site. And so when we enter this building, we're in the middle of it, which was a very peculiar and exciting thing to discover since it is so horizontal, so as it were attenuated horizontally on the outside uh, that it should turn out to be vertical is not what we had in mind and still surprises me even as I see it today. This, of course, has a lineage that reaches back to other great things. I hope the one that I think is most obvious would be the Frankfurt Reich Guggenheim, where the problem was to make the whole of the museum a promenade, whereas in, uh, in the case of the Tel Aviv Museum, the idea is to have the galleries remain rather normative while this extraordinary space gives definition only to the way we navigate the whole building. And so those galleries and that ramping around it, which resolves so many levels around the site, is rehearsing this experience, but allowing for two important models to coexist that involves the museum today. One involving the neutrality of galleries that are flexible, available for any kind of curatorial program, and the other, the museum as a spectacle of movement and public life. And the exterior envelope, as I said, is a kind of expanded version of the light well in the center with its own itinerary, which develops the site. We'll come back and look at what has happened with this, but just to give you a hint, some of you probably think this is where we are now. Another building where the site is so interestingly constraining, constraining because it offers nothing, which is typical in China today uh, in, in the case of large institutional buildings. This is a site which the, the only constraint defining it is that there is a limit of height only having, uh, only for the reasons, it's uh, only reasons having to do with the uh, fire uh, safety uh, requiring the height to remain 24 meters and no taller since this is all built on a deck of parking which is really invisible supposedly and uh, that <laughs> it be confined to a certain limit and that it housed too many galleries again, fits in that situation. Um, but the main idea here was to make the building itself an extension of the park, to actually make the park out of it uh, and thereby develop an itinerary which arises from a kind of geometry with splines and knots and they are extruded and they are finally rotated um, in order to uh, house galleries that are again uh, struggling within this peculiar configuration. It's as if I invented a site constraint for the interior, whereas in Tel Aviv it was given to me. The invention of constraints becomes very important, particularly in, in a place like China, where for an architect who thrives on constraints, it is the only way to operate.
um, yet another one, <laughs> where that question of how the site puts pressure on the building changes it. I would say here, though, unlike in the case of Tel Aviv or in Taiyuan, the site is taking what would have been a rather conventional configuration, a uh, rather standard tower and series of auditoriums and many other rooms of different sizes that would coalesce in a rather standard block and bending it and contorting it, uh, demanding that they be unified by other means. Um, and so in this case, we see the building as the kind of result of this very special and anomalous condition uh, found in an otherwise very standard uh, you know, context of, of a new campus outside of Manger. So the building's brittle or peculiar twisted you know, surfaces are all evidence of uh, this uh, contortion uh, that will to make the building conform uh, on the, in, in the site. Uh, the interior is like a rising landscape in a way. That's this sort of spiral that seems to be an obsession of mine, which manages to unify these disparate programmatic entities. This one, the anecdote, is more fun than anything else. It's a strange project. Some of you know about the Ordos project where I think 100 architects were asked to design a villa. None of them were to build. But anyway, it was a very exciting experiment. Um, and uh, we all had to pick our site from a hat. You know, there was a number, 100, you know, 100 folded pieces of paper. I was in line with a very good friend of mine, who's actually Craig Scott, and we were analyzing the sites on the model, which was there while we were waiting in line, and he had, was very nervous about picking the wrong site. He analyzed the sites very carefully, and as we did, we arrived to about five or maybe eight that were really great. You know, they allowed for a sprawling villa. They were, had wonderful topography, views of everything. They were wonderful. And then we, you know, looked at those that weren't so wonderful, and we narrowed it down to about five. And I said, Craig, let's find the worst one. Let's find the site that's the most compromised, the most constrained, the one with the least views, the one clearly with no topography, no advantage, relationships of any kind. We found this one, of course, I joke, number 47. <laughs> and uh, I have to say, I didn't feel good picking it. <laughs> I was am absolutely amazed that I had chosen it. The worst of the sites. But, of course, it was only because of that constraint that anything good could happen. It required that I make, uh, well, from the beginning, I thought, the smallest possible of the villas, though they wouldn't allow me to make it less than 10,000 square feet, which was the program for all of them. I buried most of it and gave it this kind of characteristic of being miniature with the tower itself, which is disturbed by the pressures below grade, <laughs> as it were. Uh, and uh, casting shadows in very particular ways, uh, allowing an entry in a particular way, and so forth. All of these things squeezing and uh, compressing, uh, creating the kinds of tensions that, well, make it interesting for me. The, the villa above ground, the living quarters, the villa below, the entertainment component. Um, it led to this kind of reassessment of the building. This is another project, anyway, totally different, different client. Um, for an office park, a, a, a kind of office complex, I suppose, in a park. And um, here, the topography becomes a motivating idea. What I find, what I found interesting here was the limitation imposed of that is that we have four buildings of a particular mass and that we could only set back and evacuate one level in a particular way, and I did it rather peculiarly, let's say, starting at the bottom on the left and ending by doing it on the top on the right. And you can see that those in the middle are halfway in between. And if you think about it conceptually, the first tower and the last on the far right are upside down versions of one another. In the process, <laughs> there is also a path that moves through the entirety of the scene, linking them visually uh, and also participating the path in the defining a fragment of a spiral which is dedicated to each of them independently, so that they are coherent, self-sustaining towers with their own pathways and sequences, 
but they are also bound one to the other. There are also kind of anamorphic effects that are interesting. It appears, for example, here in that building that we're looking at a corner and that maybe it's a chamfered corner, uh, when in fact, due to the angles of the plan, which are not quite 90, and given the staircase and the gap in the kind of split level inside, that is not a corner at all. In fact, that's just a single face. There are many illusions that are the result of the way in which they're situated, uh, oriented, uh, developing sequences internally and externally, um, and having to do with the fact the conflict between the uh, kind of independent series and spirals and the single spewing pathway that uh, joins them together despite their independence. Um, and so those projects, I think, really speak to the idea of the constraint in terms of self. Now I want to talk to a kind of more theoretical level that it seems to be, um, I think, would reveal more profoundness and questions uh, in the work that I, I have, which I've been enjoying considering recently, uh, which is uh, this idea about the plans that uh, these buildings are made of. Um, I would like to sort of put on the table an idea about uh, the paradigms of plans that we're working with today and where these projects are vis-a-vis -vis those uh, paradigms. This is, let's say, the most sort of present-day operative paradigm of the plan, it seems to me, that most of you probably deployed. I call it the anatomical plan. It's the plan which is created by cutting through a pre-existing form, a form that is made regardless of the plan. The plan is the result only of slicing it, after the plan has been made, and the plan is arbitrary to it. Uh, you could slice any number of plans, and n all of them are only an index of an instance of the figure which is developing continuously, in this case, the human body, in this case, a building which uh, felt in touch and brought to mind and brings to mind the same idea because any cut through it is arbitrary to its form, he slices through the building, adding up to a piling which could be something like a three-dimensional print in the old days when, the, when in such prints were laminate prints. Those are the plans, really, of that kind of architecture. This kind of plan, the anatomical pl plan, I want to analogize now with something else which is film. I think it's useful for a very particular reason which has to do with the, the other two models of the plan that I want to show you. I want you to imagine that those successive slices are quite similar to the way in which a filmic frame works, a shot in a film, and that the continuity of those films, uh, filmic shots, you know, produces the animacy that is the film itself. And they disappear. We do not see the frames. There's no particular relevance in any one of them. They are just instances of a continuous movement, uh, and uh, they are concealed by it. I would say that's what happens in the Guggenheim. Now, that's curious, because the Guggenheim is very radical in architecture. I mean, it, and there aren't too many buildings with anatomical plans in the world, really. It's a rare thing that we have them, although they're an obsession in the academy today. They're actually very rare to find in the world. Uh, but it's a very common condition in film. It's the typical condition in film. Whereas there is another idea in film which could be said to be closer to architecture, which would be thought of as quite radical within the filmic medium, which is the inverse, which is uh, represented in this case by the film of Warhol. Here we have the plan that I call Sleep. I'm not just giving it this title because of the analogy, but it's Warhol's film that's called Sleep. It's a, it's a plan in which nothing happens from one level to, mean, to another, almost nothing. I mean, a, a little, a, 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 nothing of any real consequence happens from one level to the next. It's very different than the Guggenheim where after some number of slices, or even one slice to the next, things are changing continuously. Here, n almost nothing is changing. And certainly if there are any changes, they're, they're discontinuous and very, very minor, like when, you know, someone dreaming that their eye is moving a little bit. It's, it very much does fulfill sleep. And this would characterize most plans, certainly in the modern period, the kinds of plans that we've grown to respect for many reasons. They're uneventful, but they emerge from what I would call the problem, really, of extrusion. The Guggenheim is anything but extrusion. 
and meets is only always excluded. And finally, a model which I think really operates in a different domain, which is of great interest to me, and which is the one that I'm really working on the most right now of the three models. Uh, and this would be the one I call La Cité. This is a film in which a sequence of animated shorts, as it were, are strung together. And it really would appear, given the pauses and the duration of the shots, that we have a sequence of still shots. Discontinuous, unlike the case of sleep, and a narrative that builds by virtue of the way in which we associate these still shots one to the other, it imitates the it imitates photography in the same way sleep does. That is, we know sleep is like a whole movie that looks like a single photograph. And this is like a movie that looks like a series of photographs. And there is a building as we're talking about. There are so many buildings like sleep, you know, in particular. The best example I know of the anatomical is the Guggenheim, but there are others. I mean, Yokohama Port Tomoe by FOA, that's a, that's a anatomical film. But there aren't too many of the La Gete type. The best I know is this one, RIM's project at Karlsruhe, a cultural center in about 1989, where a pile of structural truss systems uh, produces a series of differentiated plans. Look at these plans, they're all in the same building. We begin here with kind of a plan of three parts, but not organized as a tripart type. We have here a plan which is very centripetal, uh, again, but with a zone uh, dedicated to certain functions. And then we have this dualistic plan in an axis left to right, as seen here. Now we have a very centralized plan, centrifugal. Now we have the peristyle hall, a room full of columns an open fan, and there are other buildings, but they're rather, well, anomalous. This is a building, the author for whom I do not know. Uh, it's a bit like Los. I would say Los might be the antecedent to the La Gite plan. Look at this plan as we move up it. The staircases will migrate toward the back and back toward the front and central as they proceed up here. Look at, look, look at how differentiated they are. This is a very continuous and elegant sequence winding its way through this building as the rooms oscillate in scale from the back to the front. There we have the large room in the back. There we have the large room in the front. On the bottom, that proceeds and finally a bifurcated plan on the other axis. These rooms contradicting each other in axes. All of this happening in a fixed envelope just as it would in Rim's building. That dialectic of the fixity of the envelope with the turbulent interior of differentiated plans is something like the La Gete condition in which you have the fixity of the frame, the continuity of movement, but differentiation built in. Now let's look back. I'm gonna try to put the projects in these categories as best I can. I would say this is the most anatomical of the projects because as you look at it as a plan, even though the rooms are aggregating in very specific ways, according to needs and sequences, pressures building between them and so forth. They, they are all really slices from a continuous figure, a, a continuous form. And if you look, for example, at the stair winding its way up that little tower in the middle of the plan, you can see the transformations that happen when you slice the continuous form. No particular plan is more, uh, adds up to anything other than being one of many possible ones. Of course, here it's a really brittle kind of version of the anatomical. It's not very smooth. It's not continuously developed. It's discontinuously developing, but it's something like what I would call a low-resolution version of the anatomical plan. Tel Aviv, I think, is a strange hybrid. It has the anatomical in the center of it. You know that likewise. But it is very legite like Take, for example, this plan at the top of the building and the plan immediately below it. You can see that immediate transformation. There is nothing extruded structurally in this building. 
these fans are very treacherously <laughs> developed to support this possibility. The core has been evacuated from the center to give to, to give uh, space to this uh, possibility of movement, this continuous portion of the sequence would uh, move through the building. And what we see finally, if we look at the whole sequence, this is the bottom of the auditorium, is, is a 45 degree angle, we'll say, on the left where the auditorium is. And if you move up to the middle plans, we're now seeing a kind of 22 and a half degree center now defining the axis through the whole building. And finally, when you reach the top of the building, back to the 90 that lines the entire building. It's a building which is literally turning under your feet as you move through it. And the space at the center is what we would be having to cut through in the mode that I call the ensemble cut, the arbitrary slicing through a continuously developing figure. So it's a kind of low resolution rotation on the outside, a smooth and very kind of, well, much higher resolution at the center. The inner dome being smooth, the outer dome, the outdoor facade being the kind of more coarse grain toward the city. And here we can see the stacking, the stacking of systems of structure, which owe something probably to Paul Reed, the Jewish Bible program. You can see here how these systems literally are oriented independent of each other. Another hybrid, but I would say here we're looking at a different idea about where the anatomical intersects with the logical model. This is at the Taiyuan Museum that I earlier showed you. Here the anatomical is on the outside, not on the inside. It's the inverse of Tel Aviv. And the sequence is having to develop itself to conform to that difficult figure. One of the sort of devices that I like looking at here and happens in Tel Aviv too. If you look at the elevator up on the top, near the top right, it serves room, sorry, off to the right up there at the top right, and then it flips and serves rooms on the left. I mean, it, the, the building has to constantly find ways to deal with the difficulty of the external envelope, the anatomical envelope. The other thing about this that is hard for you to read and would be tedious to explain to you, and I'll spare you, is that the sequence of moving through it is very linear, very crisp, and very continuous and legible, despite all of this, uh, let's say, clamorous rotation uh, difficulty. So one can literally move through it on an axis, a visual axis that runs pretty much the whole length of the plan. Um, and that would be the means by which it sustains its discontinuity in the sense that the continuous envelope did that in a tall Jew or does it in Tel Aviv. That is the, the singularity and consistency of that outermost limit is precisely what holds those things together. Um, the linear itinerary is what does it in this case. Now the sections are clearly anatomical. Every single one of them is a structural member here, is a kind of structural section. Um, it's very conventional in that sense. It's not one of the most ambitious, ambitiously engineered buildings, but it doesn't mean, uh, by any means, I, I don't think this compromises the spatial premise, particularly in a building like a museum where most surfaces are required to be opaque and structural expression is rare, rarely available. Both Tel Aviv and uh, Taiyuan conceal their structures, allowing spaces to happen in ways we can't, don't expect because exclusion is not there. Things don't stack up as we think they should or normally would. It's a kind of what I call rook, ma, no hands kind of phenomenon where you don't know how it's happening or where you, how it is you've arrived in certain spaces and found yourself there. This is a moment where we rise up, we're on that promenade that defines the park, the external promenade, and we see overhead uh, shooting out some of our, the sequence from within. Um, there is one moment of ambition in this that I thought had been engineered very differently, which would be more consistent with the logic of that surface that defines the, what I call the anatomical envelope. You can see the tortures. 
members that build this thing, which I like very much. Um, <laughs> and uh, okay, I wanted to switch to it is. It is the category that I said had something to do with geometry and tectonics, their role in the definition of the attenuation. So here we are. We're not that far from the end uh, already. So th this is, again, Nanjing. Um, well, one of the things about Nanjing that I think is true about all of these projects is that they're trying to sustain a kind of high, you know, a heightened sense of continuity despite all of the differences within them. Here we have an envelope that the, 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 the surface, which is tile, is con constantly changing its tones um, in different shades of gray, trying to freeze in time a kind of light effect. This is very much like an anamorphic idea, since there is almost no sunshine there and it's, it's so gray. Um, now, in these cases, I wanted to show you some of the developing prin principles for the skin of the building. This was the one we used for Nanjing. All of these cases involve what I call a kind of discretization of curvature. Uh, building curves out of flat parts become, becomes an economic solution and gives evidence to the possibility for curvature, holding it at arm's length, asking, as it were, the participate, the, 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 the uh, sorry, the uh, visitor to participate in making the curve, imagining it, seeing it coming into being through its implicit construction through all of these flat parts. Um, now the tones of the, the shades of the reflective tile enhance the curvature and in a way mask the flatness of the parts further and make flat and discretized parts read similarly as you can see here. This heron bone tile, this possibility to, to use tile this way is only something one could imagine doing in a place like China. One of the things I wanted to begin to elaborate on now, which I find very interesting, is about this process of thinking of materials as a way to sustain continuity for a particular time, is that at these scales and under these conditions, they tend to transform from one to another. That is, they appear to be one material rather than the one they are. Let's say in Nanjing, that reflective tile looks something like it was metallic. Some people have thought it was metal. And in the case of a house like this, we are looking at something that looks almost like cast in place concrete. I've had people ask me, particularly a number <laughs> of Japanese people have asked me, more than one, how did you build a, con a cast in place concrete house? there in the woods. Um, the reason this looks like cast in place concrete is again a matter of attenuation. The narrowness of the boards in proportion to the scaling uh, are too, they're too fine for that dimension, the boards. They look like those that are used for board sweep, you know, for casting concrete in place. And the irrational distribution of the windows combined with evidence that the structure is behind them would make it seem that that surface is built you know, in a monolithic way. It doesn't have a kind of structural rationality of it in it. It's not divided in bays. It's not, the windows aren't distributed as they should be. And, and so it has something to do with scale, with an understanding of structure, the, di you know, the dimensions that we would expect of things, and the color. And so again, instead of going from tile to metal or from wood to concrete, uh, we're witnessing a transformation. Here's another technique using on a number of projects and failing to make a good project with over and over again, trying it, lost six competitions <laughs> using this method for thinking about the production of space, couldn't get past it. This was over the course of the last year. We finally won a very small competition for a tiny museum in Israel um, where this surface, this surface defined by flat parts becomes actually, well, the plan itself. And it develops a kind of spiraling itinerary around that small courtyard in the center. Um, and you can see it here where now for the first time the scale 
of, of the panel that produces the curvature of the room. The curvature being the foliage, which is really kind of the amphitheater on the outside, um, on one side, and a roofscape landscape on the other. This curvature now is, is not just something like, you know, the skin. It's the whole building. And uh, now here, of course, we know where we're looking at. There isn't a material transformation. I, I can't suspend the narrative to include that discussion, but I'll get back to it with this one, which is the Taiyuan, again, Taiyuan's facade unfolded flat in all of its parts. Interesting thing about Taiyuan, in comparison to Sotheby's, which we'll talk about at the end of this part of the story, the, the Taiyuan facades, because they are, well, Taiyuan envelope because it extends over the entire building, that is roof and fa facades alike are covered with tar clad, uh, is a lightweight honeycomb system of panels, uh, stone laminated, these, these panels that are sometimes, well, I'm sorry, not sometimes, they're two square meters or more than that, two and a half at least. And so they're rather large panels with this very thin layer of stone. Some of you know this kind of material. And the effect of those panels is very interesting because you look at it here, you know, in the model and you think stone, you know, stone cladding. These panels, we know what scale. They give scale to the building in a particular way that we understand. And the building is like that and it does not quite make sense this scale relative to that panelization. What's interesting here about it is that the dimension is greater and than a normal panel should be and that we're familiar with even though we don't know ourselves to be angularly, we're not conscious of it, but I would say it's rather strange to find these panels at this dimension. They are too large to be stone, normal stone. They look like metal. Again, we have this metallic effect, but when we look at them from afar, I don't have a view yet, there's enough of this to show you this, but they're not beer canning, you know, they're not, they couldn't be metal, they're too flat to be metal. It's very elusive materially because of the form, scale, color, everything. It's a very exciting and evocative thing. I mean, I think because normally these kinds of buildings cast in concrete or titanium, uh, you know, are quite familiar materially by now. And the question is how to use a very ordinary material and have it appear to be peculiar and elusive. And again, it is, I think, in that case, moving from metal to stone and back again. And now Tel Aviv is clearly the case where the material is, you know, moving in that direction really strongly and really compellingly. Again, panelization is used to rationalize, to planarize, all of these hyperbolic parabolas on the exterior only though, by the way, not in the light ball, the central, central space that I'm showing you. Here we use this method, quad panelization of the hyperbolic paraboloid. And this is what happens. Um, now there are 460 differently shaped panels. Um, some of them are as large as 30 square meters. So 300 square feet, these are really large pieces. Very peculiar scale effect arising from having pieces that large. One doesn't quite know what material this is. Again, metal is what people guess it is. Most people who see it from afar have had arrived with an architect saying these things, but they have no idea what's going on with metal when we are quite some distance approaching it. Um, it when you get near it, and I wish I could show this to you, is unmistakably marble. And the reason for this is it's a very fine, powdered, white concrete, and it's been cast on smooth, uh, a very smooth steel table, all of them were, with magnetic boundaries that were moved and rotated to generate the 400, the many shapes, the 460 different panel shapes. And it is so smooth and impervious and, and, and so, well, you know, delicious to touch. It's just so remarkably smooth. It, it really is surprising that it's concrete. Um, and the shape somehow can 
combined with the smoothness makes it seem marble like when you're near it so it changes in your relationship to it depending on whether you're near or far from it but it never seems to be well it it could seem to be concrete but that's not its strongest evocation um though it's looking rather concrete to me right now uh, <laughs> admittedly uh, um but it, it, is, it is an exciting thing. I think it benefits from being pre-painted. This is a steel-framed building, and this is a curtain rod. These panels are hung directly on a steel frame, and they are the building envelope itself. This is not a building clad. That is the wall. That is the weather barrier, uh, literally. It is, the, it is a waterproof membrane from the interior frayed with an enormously and incredibly heavy wa waterproofing, which is the final guard uh, for any uh, emissions from human nature, the interior. But uh, this surface is, uh, is a surprising outcome of a long struggle to engineer the exterior. There was a time when the building was cast in place, was to have been cast in place and clad, but the stone would be hanging upside down and in Israel, they would not accept the light panel that I described that I used in Pi Yuan because the industry hasn't been appeased in Israel, I think because it was just heard that the stone industry was so important there. There are political reasons, I believe, behind not having that product approved in Israel. The laminate has not been tested sufficiently uh, to have been approved yet. And it saved me, therefore, from stone which is, of course, uh, a problematic material to use there because of its uh, associations with a kind of Jerusalem, Jerusalemification, if I may say so, of Tel Aviv, which is the city of white cement. I mean, it's a very beautiful modern city, but the postmodern intrusion of those stone buildings is something I wanted to resist from the beginning. And so making the building curved was a way to preclude the possibility of building it in stone, it would be too expensive with a curved stone. But when we flattened all the panels, it was possible again to make it in stone. And the only thing that prevented it from happening was that many of the forms would require that they hang, and that was regarded to be very problematic. So we re-engineered the entire envelope. It moved away from cladding. So political problems and constraints, those were the things that led finally back to the solution that I hoped we would arrive to the concrete, but not the concrete of Tel Aviv. As I said, this is pre-cast, pre I'm sorry, pre-cast, not uh, the cast in place of the buildings of Tel Aviv. Now this is the cast in place. This is the moment of Tel Aviv in a way, now entirely interiorized. We modeled and studied it over and over again. Here it is in construction, and I'm showing you this for the first time. It's not online. I am not able to put it online yet. I've never shown it in public, but this was just unveiled about 10 days ago. The, the space had been filled with successive levels of uh, scaffolding, and it has been now for more than two and a half years. So this was quite an astonishing moment for everyone. The builders were, they were more amazed than any of us uh, even to see it finally open dirty because literally they'd just taken off the <laughs> all the construction and uh, smelled something and are now making their way from top to bottom to finish that surface. One of the things that I think is really strong and evident about this space that I like so much is the, the torquing of the plans. The fact that you witness that and find it so impossible really to understand where you are in, in terms of your orientation. You know where you are in this building, always. You can move through it very reasonably and well, I believe. The paths lead you well through it, but when you're in any of the rooms, it is always surprising when you've been looking back at this space to discover which way you were facing. You've been turned in ways that you can't really make sense of easily. Here we are at the bottom of the building. 
Uh, this is the loftiest of the spaces, very high. Here, here oh, sorry, the, these slides were thrown together, very new. This is the lobby of the building. Now you can see how the light ball, which has been named that by the director, um, is creating a kind of sectional rotation, a, a, a portion in the vertical ax axis. But again, that is happening while the plans are turning. You see a bit of the escalator on the 45 degree axis. On the left there, we're on this bridge on the, on the 22 and a half degree. And we can't see here the 90 degree rotation. Yeah. That's the bridge crossing the, uh, the final level below. So there are places, there are a few places where you see all three together. The largest gallery at the bottom of the building is a 10,000 square foot space. And it has some two tier panels in it. That's just one bit of the light ball embedding. This is at the bottom, what I call the 90 degree plan. An incredible story actually in and of itself, how this happened. Why should this building have been allowed to be built? I mean, the plans are insane. There was a moment when the director recognized that and said, Jeff, you men, you can have a union. I mean, Moti, I mean, you're incredible, uh, courageous. <laughs> You'd have to be crazy to build this. Uh, but, uh, you know, he looked at me and said, how the hell did we get here? What am I looking at? There was not a governing board overseeing the process. He dealt with it absolutely independently. He w it was a master of the museum and didn't let anyone interfere with the process. Uh, we convinced him not to use a local architecture firm. We didn't want to have an associate firm. I thought they would end up messing up. And instead, I brought on board a meet Nimler an Israeli architect who came to the United States and worked for two and a half years on detailing this building with me in the office so that we could follow it through from the vision all the way to the end. Very unusual process, not normally what's possible because it's illegal. It is not really even allowed. You have to be, a, a foreign architect has to be associated in Israel with a local firm. But he contorted everything and the left, he found a way and he negotiated with the mayor from the top down and made it happen. Uh, it's incredible. You have to have a, a leader as a client to have a building like this. This is one of my very favorite views right now of the project because uh, here I think you really can see the way one of the, uh, this is the 45 degree now seen from the, seen through the window of the 22 and a half. It literally you can see it's passing under your feet. If you look at this bit up here, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, you're not seeing that very well. Okay. Way up there on the far left, you can see a fragment of one of the openings in the light ball itself. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about right now, but there's a kind of fragment of one of the openings in the light ball. And then there's this longer fragment visible around the center of the photograph. The, the fragment that's in the center of the photograph is pointing straight down. It's parallel to that small fragment up there on the left that isn't very easily seen. But that one proceeds under that ramp. It proceeds for many meters below it. So you literally recognize the, 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 the you know, monumental form is passing below the plan you are inhabiting. It is very surprising. All of these, by the way, are parallel to each other, these, these large voids. They establish a series of parallels. Um, the, one, the long one on the left and the long one on the right, they're parallel to each other in plan. And there's a parallel for every one of them. Every one of them is paired with another one. And so there's a kind of rational basis uh, underlying all of this. Those parallels link to galleries. They're the edges of galleries. Oh, just a few interesting ones here. You know, the disagreement of, the, of this 
large scale thing with the incidental conditions which surround it, for example, the stair shape. I mean, the stairs and the ramps are moving around this, but of course accommodate more specifics and fine grains and differentiations that are programmatic. And so things like the glass rail there have to adapt, have to make the difference possible between the stair and the void of the pipe bar, which moves at a different angle. Here you see the rotation of the plan beyond that light well. You win one project at the end. Bad, shouldn't have. This is a new <laughs> project for a library we're doing, and the whole thing is accommodated. Here we go, we're back to the anatomical. I mean, and it means that some of it's unavoidable, particularly in a site like that where nothing is happening. But this is more like true to the Guggenheim, true to the source. It's a, it's a continuous spiral of books. Really hard to happen because the timing in China, which has most of you know, is a rush to get everything done. Well, the problem here was this is an unprecedented fire zone, a single fire zone of this dimension. And again, we had to work our way through the mayor. Again, I have a visionary comment. He is a madman. He really is exceptional. This mayor, from top down, put pressure on those people in the bureaucracy to allow us to approve it much earlier than it normally would be. Normally it would take really much plan attenuation and attenuated processes which would extend beyond the limit of time for the whole schedule of the project. They would take their time reviewing whether this would work and the building should already have been finished by the time they would be finished if they were reviewed. So we've managed to get past this and uh, hope it looks well, it looks like we're doing the most. This is going to be an all glass building. Now, what material will that appear to turn into? I don't know yet. I'm hoping it won't look glass. It will turn into something. Can't say what yet. Definitely an anatomical plan. You can see the slicing through the section C. That's an anatomical plan. You've got an anatomical section. That's just the way it has to be. I'm going to stop there. There's another one, but you know, it's much more interesting to listen to you with your questions if you have any. And I'd really just like to thank you for coming tonight. And I'll take the questions if you have any. I don't know if it's, it's convention here to have a few questions. don't know that from the the Salk Institute of Khan I should memorize what the mixture is. You know, if Amit were standing here, he could give you, and he would be able to tell you precisely what happened there. The tests that were done, as you can imagine, it was a, a long process to arrive to this particular solution because the problem with white cement is that it ages in a, in a way that we didn't want it to. It turns yellow. So there was, a, you know, you have to pull back and kind of move back into the gray. Um, but in the city kept saying that's too gray. <laughs> so we were, we were kind of moving in a very narrow band. But the, um, <coughs> the weight and the vibration of the table in the process of, of uh, in the casting process, the weight and the powder, all of these things combined to produce the effect that we arrived to. There were, you know, bubbles and aggregate problems early on, and that was not as smooth and as perfect as we had hoped in some of the early some of the very early 
pets. But uh, we were benefiting from having uh, a contractor who had worked quite a bit with a crew cat project many years ago. Primarily had been working with sock teeth um, on underbuilding theory. And so we were moving beyond those happily into a new theory. That's hard to look at. I want to get back to the, I don't know what happened there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, maybe the lights should come back on. Um, but basically the, um, the, um, the Yad Vashem was depressing. But that was, that was cast in place. So this is a really interesting experiment. you've shown us today, was there one in particular that um, kind of epitomized or best represented the criteria or like the, the anatomical section? Was there one that was kind of the prime project? Well, I, th I think the, it's, a, it's a general term that I'm using that you could apply to many projects where the geometry of it cannot at any moment be cut with a plane which would, uh, if a plane cutting against the form is in a way irrational to cut it that way. And so they, any in which that appeared to occur would uh, be representing that idea. But I think your point is interesting. It's an interesting question because the, in the case of the Nanjing, for example, you know it's pretty straightforward geometrically. And so one could make the argument that it's a tenuous analogy to call it anatomical, but it had to do with the sequence of motion, the movement of the stair, the slope of the roof, less than it had to do with continuous geometry curvature, for example. So I do, you know, for me, actually, that's kind of the, is the means by which architecture becomes anatomical. That is the sequence and the rising of the plan and the slope is the structural sequence, things such as that. Whereas the interior of Tel Aviv is a more rarefied condition and clearly closer to the anatomical, you know, in the most literal sense, because it's geometrical and anatomical. So maybe Nanjing is the more apt way to pull architecture into the question of anatomical, because it doesn't do it by means of curvature. It does it within the lexicon of things that architecture has at its command, regardless of its particular shape, regardless of its whether it's smooth or not. Thank you, Scott. On that subject, well, first of all, amazing work. Um, and it's fascinating uh, to hear the author establish a kind of, again, a taxonomic frame within which to establish categories for all of this that comes in. <coughs> it, it seems to me that one of the criteria by which it moves from the anatomical into the more uh, discontinuous uh, type topological condition is also based upon the program uh, and the swell to which certain event spaces need to be accommodated for. So there's a, there's a kind of hidden battle behind the scenes with respect to assuming territory in the context of introducing a strategy of gyration, uh, you, you have to negotiate with those uh, programmatic entities. And then the second hidden force, it seems to me, is, is uh, a link between the uh, economy of things. Mm -hmm. And you said, and I forget which project, but you were, uh, it was a, a kind of self-commentary on the structural system prefacing, you, you said this may be, and I don't think you used the word normative, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was more familiar, and my mm -hmm. sense was that uh, it had given uh, a far more generous budget on certain projects, you would increase the bar in terms of what the, the <coughs> technological skeleton, how it would perform in order to accommodate uh, for the complexity that you're so fascinated state that with a more conventional structural system, inevitably you're going to have to, you, your horizontal plan cuts are going to show that the structure, the columns, the framing system is moving along a single set of coordinates whereby um, uh, your, your most 
interesting or what the, <clears throat> the space that you aspire to most is caught emblematically within the center of the Tel Aviv project, where there's an impossibility on all levels to be able to decipher it as a singular position or that the logic will uh, reveal itself at any one moment in time. It's always escaping a kind of rationale or legibility, which is the beauty of the best of the world and certainly where your theoretical position is so unique. Well, in any given level, there's a duration, there's a kind of question of duration to it, which is what you're speaking about. Because when you're in the galleries on the main level, let's say, uh, you know, the walls are vertical and there's the, in a normative space, these cubic galleries. But just below and above your other galleries that are oriented other ways and have no relation to the gallery you're in, only when you're at the light bulb do you see the continuity, the continuity that produces the anatomical. So it's, it, it, that's why I said that's the kind of anatomical nested within the legitaire. If you could put those two models together, that was the idea there, that there's the light bulb is doing the job of keeping moving these series of steel shots, you know, that are each plan. Each plan is like a steel shot. Whereas, you know, in the Karlsruhe or Kohlhaas, there isn't anything anatomical about the light bulb. The continuity is that the envelope is extruded. There isn't any torsion or, you know, motion of the kind that geometry produces. So the question is whether you could re, uh, the, the, the I think the project puts pressure on the two understandings. It might be pushing too hard. I mean, I don't know how this comes together, but it's pretty interesting to see whether you can read them both at the same time. Um, I, I, I hope you're right. When you get into the galleries, deep in the plan, by the way, you know, you forget. And that's right. I mean, it should happen because it wouldn't be tolerable to the curator if it weren't for that possibility that you could become absorbed in normal spaces and normal exhibits and forget the question of the kind of, you know, all around uh, determining the positions of those spaces. It's when you emerge from the gallery that you recognize where you've been, where you're not, how it is for you to in fact learn all of those things. But when you're, as I said, in them, things are as, as often they are in museums. It delivers a space that's very effective for any number of reasons that you can think of today. Um, as this particular director, who's the curator also, Moshi Yonaiva, mentioned, very strict about galleries, very agitated that I ever would intrude on them, hated that episode where the light bulb invaded the gallery. In fact, at one time, it was closed to view and was not going to be exposed in that room. He couldn't accept that architecture would interfere with his freedom to develop his fictional historical program. He hated that. You are to control what everyone is doing. He got very angry about that. <laughs> um, he's still annoyed by that beautiful episode of intrusion of the light bulb. Scott, here's a question. You, you, yeah. you had uh, uh, your, your description of the project from China, and you were talking about a kind of sightlessness curious because your, your work uh, in a beautiful way lives between the object and, and uh, a kind of uh, a wonderfully uh, inequitable sense of, of not <coughs> again in its totality. It, it appears and disappears. And certainly in the context of challenges the autonomy of the buildings on both sides and by fusing together using a, a kind of hyperbolic condition it absolutely transforms the understanding of sites. So China's uh, offering you sites that have no content. Uh, Jerusalem uh, 
totally it is. And I imagine that as you continue to build, uh, the context within which you work or the fabric will be far more complex and dense and that your building will have to be understood simultaneously from the center to the periphery, but from the periphery to the city. Uh, and it's, it's curious how it, I can imagine a situation where your building would be there and not be there. It would transform the city as a, as a condition as well. I hope it does. <laughs> yeah, both, I think Tel Aviv and the New York are somewhat similar in the sense that they are so tied to you know the particular limits these very precise angles and you know the situation of the site is they're drawn into the world they come really much a part of it um, that that really is the ambition there is the kind of architecture that dissolves into the complex rather than stands as a, a autonomous option yeah. oh yeah go ahead I'm wondering if you could describe the relationship between the white ball in Tel Aviv and the exterior of the building because um, I was just wondering uh, what was your intent behind it and how they formed um, together in reaction to one another. Uh -huh. um, that's a very interesting story. There was a crisis in the development of this project. And actually, Andy Summers, who's, uh, who's here now, Saunders, who's here now, was with me during this crisis uh, at the, in the early stages of the competition. There was a great idea for the interior. Uh, I thought, and so did the jury. But after the, you know, the competition jury, it was decided that the exterior was just simply too awful to be, you know, a worthy use of property. They really wanted to, so they um, they basically decided to. They didn't like any of the others, so they said, "Let's have another stage in in the competition." And they asked three of us to continue. We had lengthy discussions with the jurors. That was the, the idea, that they would help us to determine which direction to go in. And it was all about how could the exterior be developed to respond to what had happened inside. Um, Andy Saunders was on the team of the second stage. That, that particular exterior is somewhat like what we have today. And it, in, the, it is where we ended up, which was to reconstitute hyperbolic parameter that is in a different proportion on the outer edge. So imagine you took this super, you know, this is vertical collection of hyperbolic parameters that are creating what you can term the, the, plan, the plan of rotated plan, I mean the building of rotated plan stack. You took that entire facade and you kind of expanded it. It shrunk in the vertical axis. It became nearly triangular rather than the shape it was inside. That's the facade. The facade is actually the same morphology, and I could show it, I could do a formal reading for you, a formal analysis to show you how all of its elements are variations on the, of the elements that define the light ball itself. For example, you know how the light ball has those big voids in it? We don't have those voids on the facade, but they're flat planes on the facade. They're the only aspects of the facade that are completely plain. They're just filled in, but they're the same shape as the voids on the inside. So those big voids that you saw inside, which are parallelograms, we have giant parallelogram flat planes on the outside which correspond to them. So the outside is a ver version of the inside, and then it's disketal. It's treated differently when it gets constructed. The inside is smooth, and the outside is rough. It's kind of the, the smooth, the, the rustic and the refined, you know, the dialectic between the inside and the outside. It goes back to a very kind of traditional idea about which is that the outside is this big scale tough, you know, and registers a very different kind of experience than the, the inside. And then you have the smoothness of the inside. I guess my theory would be that that kind of smoothness doesn't belong on the outside. It isn't appropriate for an urban construction. Zahavi would disagree. <laughs> she would like the outside to be as smooth as it can be. But I, I like the idea that the exterior is implicitly smooth, but not from afar, you might mistake it for a curve, but as you approach it, you understand its scale, its bigness, it has to break down and build the curve by other means. I like that dialectic of the near and the far. I think a building that's smooth, like a Zaha, that stays smooth relentlessly, you're far away, it's smooth. You're near it, it's smooth. 
this is not the kind of experience of the attenuated threshold. We're not getting there yet. I, I like the idea that you're moving into and toward uh, something that's changing. Then, of course, we have this abrupt transition. After it's gotten so rough and so big, we go in and we see the absolute inverse, the, mo the smoothest rendition of all, and we can touch it, and it's really kind of a very sensual experience. So th I like very much to think about how to deal materially and syntactically with these, these transitions as well. I didn't speak to those earlier, but those are really significant. I mean, sometimes the building should be turned inside out. I would say the Goodman House, the building, the house in New York, it's something like turned inside out because you have this very refined scale of the setting. You know, it's like interior paneling almost, the scale of it, on the outside. But this is a house. To turn a house inside out is very different than to turn a very large public building inside out. You know, you don't have the great distance and the nearness and it's a very different experience with that building. You don't look at it as an object that way. But a building in the city has to change and has to respond to so many different things at different scales. I don't know if that helps, but it's a little too lengthy an explanation. <laughs> The site is changing, which is kind of the tearing down things around and which I pushed for and was very exciting. There was a question here in the middle. I do want to just tell it. I'm a first year student and what sort of really interests me is the sort of trajectory that, that many students here take from their first year to the fifth year. And I was sort of wondering, you know, maybe if you could tell us maybe what was your thesis in like gore, how did your gory sort of impact you in your career to get you to, you know, the, the best of your projects that you guys just showed? That's a very good question. Wow, that's great. Really, it is. It's incredibly good. Um, wow, how did this happen? Um, <laughs> God, no, I mean, where the hell did, how did any of this happen? Oh my God. Well, I mean, the way we were taught is different than you are today. You're taught with such sophisticated tools. I mean, are you already, you're modeling, right? You're already building models, computer models. Good, you should start right from the get-go, no no reason to start from that. Um, but that's so different than the way I did it. I had to arrive here and discover the power of it. It's so, oh, it's so different. I mean, I, I wonder whether the amazement we experience uh, about anything can be experienced by you. I hope it can. The stakes are higher now. You have to find the extraordinary in, in other ways. It was something that hit us like a tidal wave, but only after school. All of my years in school were done in a very kind of archaic way. Um, but I would say, okay, to answer your question, I was um, um, drawn into the uh, idea of distortion, I think, early on. Um, how? Uh, let me think about it. Um, well, uh, in those days, the most popular theory text was and you've heard all about it by now probably, Colin Rhodes. Have you been reading that in your theory and history courses? Have you been reading? Okay. Well, that was big for our, in our time. Although, by the way, it was already very old. I mean, this text called The Mathematics of the Ideal Villa by Colin Rhodes, it's so tremendously significant in, in the theory of architecture when I was a student. But it was already 40 years old, 30 years old at least at that time. Um, but it had been revived as a very profound uh, kind of um, reflection on architecture. It was about tensions and about com combinations that were bizarre uh, that, he repre that he thought existed in Corbusier. He basically turned Corbusier inside out and upside down. He analyzed it in a way that was so thrilling to me. And I remember reading this really and truly and wanting to make buildings that would be as good, would be good enough for Colin Rowe to analyze. I, I literally aspired to produce works that would be able to be interpreted in that profound a way. That was my number one ambition as a sophomore in theory. And tr I was trying to make facades that would read the way he read those things. And it was weird, I mean, because you know, you're trying to work toward a text and it's not specific because you're doing another project, not the one that he read. I still like doing this. I still aim to create forms that will read in a certain way, that will be interpreted a certain way, that will be understood a certain way. 
So I had an idea about how I want the building to be understood first through these experiences of reading. And then I tried to make buildings that would have those effects. But of course, I did it in a different way than the original buildings were done. Um, but there are other things. By the way, I wanted to do an art fiction, but I was very little. Um, and so I had other buildings in my memory that I loved as a child. There were other kinds of more sentimental origins for my the, the way in which I thought about architecture within my story. Um, even recently, I had the epiphany and the memory and this frame, this experience when I was interviewed about my childhood and how it affected me. I realized that there was a hotel, and I, and I remember it a few times over the years that it really hit me again. It looks a little bit like the light bulb, not twisted. But it's a hotel in my hometown, which was a smooth, modern interior atrium built in 1913, which I found by accident as a kid because we weren't allowed to go into this like strange atrium that was just in a private part of a very rough stone building. I mean, this is the kind of building you might find in this part of the United States. It's an old inn, which was made of huge boulders, rustic, very beautiful, rough stone building with this incredibly refined atrium that, you know, was so modern. It's really weird, really interesting kind of composite of an inside-outside for me. I think the inside-outside thing always captivated me, that they weren't the same thing. That's a very anti-modern idea. You know, the moderns were interested in kind of isotopic thing where the outside and the outside correspond. They're one and the same, they're related very directly. I never desired that. I always thought of them independently. Now that's a that can be a serious bad thing. You could get a very bad crit <laughs> for doing a building where the inside doesn't relate to the outside. For me, you might get a great crit, but uh, <laughs> depends how you bring them together, how you bring these unrelated things together. I don't know how to answer you except that I would say texts are inspired. Texts and buildings, certain buildings. You have to become captivated by particular works that do something that you think is amazing for no particular reason. It might be ineffable, as uh, Rick Beam says. Be ineffable. That's absolutely the right word for it. Evan put it well. Just a final question. Anyone? Huh? Your choice. Oh, wait. There's so many hands. What am I going to do? Which hand's going up the most vigorously? Oh, right there. Okay. Um, <laughs> 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 hmm. I don't know. That's kind of a weird intuition. I think I came across this. A lot of people theorize film. I don't think it's such an original discovery, in my opinion. I mean, it's pretty widely thought of as an important film. So I, I, I don't want to lay claim to some like amazing understanding there. Th but the connection to Carlsbad was kind of fun. I mean, I have to admit, I like that. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. That's a good question. What made that happen? I always loved Carlsbad. I, I got so excited reading his narrative, Car Ram Kulhas' description of the arrival to the idea of home. Because it is the New York Manifesto. You know, it is learning. Uh, here comes a text for you that came out when I was a student in 1978. Incredible text called Delirious New York. In fact, one of the most thrilling texts, uh, Delirious New York, because it turns Manhattan, which is purely economically determined, into a kind of manifesto for a possible social we condemned to experience, which was radical and utterly polemical, but never was thought about that way before. He calls it a retroactive manifesto. He turns something that you discover in your life that you hadn't thought of one way into something else. Highly theoretical. Inverts New York. Anyway, why did I bring up New York? Oh, because that building is his translation of New York, the Carlsberg, which is he talks about stacking and closing. And, you know, in the athletic club, there's just a stack of independent experiences, all stacked up and made possible by the elevator. That kind of urbanity of, you know, adjacency to an institution in the stack uh, is what he tried to build and make so architecturally explicit in Carlsbad. I mean, he literally stacked different kinds of plans. He's not just stacking different activities. And that's really, I think, very exciting.
Um, I don't know. I don't know how these things happen. You have these intuitions. I'm not the master of making connections, by the way, between theory and art and things like that. I'm sure any others could do it so well. It's one of my favorite things that you can do that way. So I'm not trying to affect it too much. But I'm glad you like that particular analogy. I, I hope to find more. And it's rare that I find them. It's just so fitting. So if there's one you think of, I wish they came far more easily. Okay. So let's discover one of those over years, at least a month. <laughs> Thank you.